IRL versus URL. Uh, I, URL being short for online, the digital world, which most of you will be probably mostly familiar with. IRL in our little device here stands for in real life. You see what I did there? Or offline. And having come up with that neat little, uh, what's the word, epithet to describe the topic, uh, we immediately found that uh, it has been co-opted by another group of people already. So uh, if you Google it, if any of you are here to learn more about the agonies of teenagers growing up and reconciling their social media personalities with their real-world personalities, apologies. I've got no interest in that at all. I'm a marketeer um, and a founder of Captive Media, a company I'm not going to talk about today, uh, although... I guess the reason I can talk about uh, this topic is Captive Media is a real world advertising uh, network with digital characteristics. We put screens in loos, not to put too fine a point of it, uh, more of which uh, later. But um, we think quite carefully about how consumers receive marketing of all its forms, be it digital or poster sites, television, and what I'd like to do today, I'm going to deluge you with some data. We are quite analytical in the way we think. This talk, along with others um, that Captive Media do, will be available on our website. You can get downloads of all the data from me if you'd like to come up afterwards. Um, but I'd like to start by putting a slight downer on things. This is a cartoon published in Private Eye recently. I guess seeing as I have to explain it, it's perhaps a little hard to see. The crowd of people on their mobile phones are t oblivious to the alien invasion, so the chap in yellow is saying, look everyone, oh never mind. Um, and so my downer is to assert to you, in a provocative way, that we are actually in the midst of a crisis. Marketing is in the middle of a crisis. There's not much talked about. Uh, so yes, not a Euro crisis, not a housing crisis, but an attention crisis. That is the elephant in the room that I'd like to noodle away at a little bit this morning. Consumers have very largely switched off to many, many forms of marketing. So how do we get their attention? That is the challenge. Um, does anybody recognize this? rows of uh, folk on the tube or the train or maybe even auditoriums glaring at their mobile phones. This is such a pronounced effect that Ofcom uh, recently coined the term. It actually it was originally coined by a Harvard, Harvard academic, but they picked it up in their 2011 comms review. Continuous partial attention. It's the mind state that millennials in particular exist in, that's under 35-year-olds, probably most of the people in this room, of sort of keeping one ear, one eye, or whatever it is they're doing, but the other eye or both eyes on their mobile phones, which, are, of course, are getting more entertaining, smarter all the time. Mark Reed of WPP joked at a thing I was at the other day that our phones will soon be so smart that when it is we're about to walk into a lamppost, they're going to send us an alert. Um, <laughs> It's true. So we are all bombarded, however, with ads and messages, whether it's on our phones or in our daily lives. Over 600 ads per day, or more, depending on which research you read. And consequently, of course, we are all filtering these out as never before, certainly more than a decade or two ago. Um, we are also, and I'll come back to this, watching less traditional TV, than we did, and less traditional media. And I'm going to really hammer some stats on that, because I think it's really surprising just how pronounced this effect is. We are, however, also out and about 30% more than we were a decade ago, which has other consequences for the in real life versus URL online advertising. 
Right. John Wanamaker said famously, I know that half of everything I spend on advertising is wasted. The problem is I just don't know which half. And this has led in recent years, over the last five decades, to what I would call the rise of targeting as a goal in media. Um, focused audience. Audience of one. These are all good things. Um, and it is true that the technology, particularly of digital, is enabling us to target in ways we never did before, behavioral. Uh, um, and yet, at the risk of stating the obvious, with my first controversial or provocative equation, targeting is not attention. Just because you've all been targeted by probably several dozen ads today does not mean you've paid any attention to them. My wife shops online for clothes for the kids. And every morning, we have to wade through piles of mini Bowden brochures that drop through our front door, or white stuff company, whatever it is. We are being targeted, but it doesn't mean we do anything other than put them in the bin if it's, we're not interested at the time. And this leads to a certain amount of frustration on the part of advertisers who worry about why they don't get a higher return on their investment, and consumers who feel they're being spammed, to put it bluntly. We're all overloaded with ad messages. So, my second controversial assertion to you today is that happiness, you could call this attention, but let's drop the, let's call it happiness for the consumer and the advertiser. I, I assert a, an equation for this happiness, that it's a function of three things. Targeting, yes. Though I'm actually going to talk less about targeting because we know that that's what online and digital does best. I'll talk a bit about it, but more about cut through. If you are in close proximity to an ad, what are the chances you'll notice it? Good advertising needs to cut through. And lastly, impact. Given that you've seen something, how likely are you to be influenced by it? And this is the real topic today, how real world and online interact to produce influence. We all really want to influence purchase behavior or any kind of behavior. It might be getting yourself checked for cancer. There's any number of good, socially useful goals as well. But um, let's start with the money. And I'd like to uh, share with you some interesting stats about what the industry as a whole is spending its money on. And if the industry is smart, it should be getting value for money, right? So, real world, IRL, online, URL. That is blue and green here. The global advertising industry is worth 600 billion a year, roughly. Or was in, I think this data is 2014, but it's stable-ish. 30% of all ad spend that's 180 billion, is online, which includes search, it includes display, it includes mobile. We'll unpack that a little bit. So in other words, 70% is real world, television, posters. So 30% of global ad spend is URL, online. Where do we actually spend our money? Well, actually only 6% of it is spent online. All we hear about e-commerce, and I'm sure you'll order things and buy your music and your movies and maybe groceries online, uh, it's actually only 6% worldwide. A little bit more in some countries like the UK, which is leading, even the US, it's probably 7%, but globally. So are we spending too much on online and digital advertising? Have we somehow become over enamored with the technology and are the consumers actually paying any attention? So let's unpick this a little bit more. Where is it being spent? So at the start of a little blizzard of numbers. Here is global spend by media a decade ago. And what you can see is that most of it, the blue at the bottom, is television. Largest share of all ad spending, 36.8%. There's internet in green. And Actually, a decade ago, look at the orange and the red. 
That's newspapers and magazines, so press. Uh, you've got cinema, radio, and outdoor at the top there. Uh, my company, Captive Media, is probably part of outdoor. Now fast forward to 2013, and what you can really see is the rise of online, the rise of the URL. That's the green, remember? Internet is eating the lunch of newspapers and magazines to a degree. Okay? And if we bring it right up to date, 2017, these are forecast numbers, you can see, look at the orange and the red pink. So newspapers and magazines, look how much that's shrunk. It's basically had its lunch eaten by online. Um, so anybody who, that's why the independent went out of print at the end of March, that's why the newspaper industry is hemorrhaging subscribers, it's in a terrible state. That's why magazine titles ranging from, uh, well, loaded to Maxim to FHM, particularly the male-oriented general interest titles have, have simply gone out of print as well. And that's, that's an interesting one, I could, it's a different topic, but that is a peculiarly male general interest press problem. The same has not happened to Closer and Cosmo and L and Vogue and more female skewed titles. They've borne up much better for various reasons, but anyway. Online has eaten offline's lunch over the last decade, except, look at the television number at the bottom. It's remarkably resilient. And this is, um, you know, I think, an interesting feature of how the ad industry works. And that's unpick television a little bit more. So this is, these are US figures, but this is global spend on TV advertising between 2012 and 2016. And it's rising. It's doing very well. And it's often said that TV is, it is, it's doing fine as a medium. Um, this is despite the fact that viewership is dropping. And it is really dropping. So this is, these are figures, again, US, for linear TV viewership. Now, let me fess up and be, be absolutely clear what that, I mean by that, you probably know, but linear means you're watching TV in the good old fashioned way, as opposed to time shifting it, recording it and watching it on your Sky Plus box or whatever. And it certainly excludes iPlayer, and again, we'll come to that. I'm going to unpick even this in a, in a second. But linear TV viewership has dropped 30% since 2010. And yet the spend on it by advertisers has gone up. Um, and is there anyone here from the TV industry? Aha. Uh -huh. uh, who do you work for? Okay. Great, okay. <laughs> uh, Okay, I'm glad you're not a media planner who's uh, buying all that. But um, anyway, if we can go into it. It's quite a controversial topic. Many people will say, oh, TV is still the only medium that can deliver a mass audience, which is true. You know, for the slot in the middle of X Factor on a Saturday night, it applies to 0.1% of the inventory. Um, I'm just going to hammer this home a bit more. This complicated chart is from the TV industry's own marketing group. It's called uh, Thinkbox. Um, and the roundels basically show under their headline that TV dominates the world of video. That's their headline. And TV here is the purple one. Uh, the, the outer roundel is all individuals and the inner roundel, which I think is the interesting one because that's young consumers whose media habits will form the future. 48.8% dominant still consume their video, their content, on linear TV, as opposed to, uh, in the pink, that's playback TV, that's when you record it, uh, video on demand, DVD, sin uh, online, online adult gets its own category, interestingly, and YouTube at the top in yellow. TV is dominant. TV is less than half of our video consumption already for, for the younger consumers, not for elderly folk like me. But it's less than half. Or it was in 2014. These, uh, this is a 2014 figure, and just because 
I feel quite strongly about this. I looked out on Thinkbox's own website, the 2015 figure, which has just been published. There it is. The colors are different. Very hard to read. But this equivalent figure is now it's very hard to read, so I thought I'd just help them. 43.5%. So in the last year, it's dropped another 5%. So something very dramatic is happening to our viewing habits, and it's not being talked about much in the industry. Anyway, that's TV. So maybe, a TV, remember, is generally regarded as an offline media in most of its forms. It's traditional, uh, as opposed to URL, so online. Maybe URL is therefore the answer. And remember that 180 billion is being spent on it. These are a couple of mobile ads. I think I asked the team, this is in app, and that is display. So let's have a look at what's happening to spend there. And here, something interesting is happening. Uh, again, these are growth figures for spend. Again, this happens to be the US, but it's symptomatic from 2013. They projected all the way forward to 2019. And the blue is laptop or desktop, traditional online. Beg your pardon, so, so sorry. The blue is mobile, and the, the pink is traditional laptop, desktop. So what you can straight away see is that spend is actually now dropping on traditional online uh, advertising. It's growing in mobile. Mo mobile is, growing, is driving this sector. Which, does that ring, strike anyone as odd? Hands up if you have seen and responded to an ad on your mobile phone lately. One, two, three. Okay, I can probably see a dozen hands out of, I don't know, 50 people. I mean, yeah, the industry is not stupid, but does it work? All, all I would say is there are some issues with online advertising which are beginning to be discussed in the press. So... Again, you may have seen discussion of viewability. When a display ad is served, was it actually viewable? Anybody seen that controversy? The IAB defines viewable as 50% of the pixels of your ad are above the fold for two seconds at least, which is a pretty low bar for viewability. Um, bots and fraud, the idea you may have seen reported that up to 30% of served ads were actually served or viewed rather by bots, um, which if you're charging for it, it's a strong word, but some people say it's fraud. And, and above all, ad blocking. Uh, 200 million people had downloaded ad blocking software by the end of last year, according to The Economist. Hands up who has ad blocking software. Oh, wow. Hands up if you don't have ad blocking software. Right, okay, maybe I can see half a dozen. So basically 80% of this room has ad blocking software. And that, yeah, depending on the figures, they reckon 80% of German millennials have ad blocking software. That's just the figures I've seen. And it, in a sense, the industry has itself to blame for this. It was summed up by Larry Page at Google's shareholder meeting last summer. Part of it is the industry needs to be better at producing ads that are less annoying. And I think that's a challenge for online or URL ads to, uh, people quite like TV ads. The, the content quality is, it has raised its game over the last decade or so, and that hasn't happened in the same way for uh, online ads. So, um, here's my little equation. Happiness is targeting, cut through, an impact. I just want to share with you a little bit of research that we've done at Captive Media to see if we can measure the relative cut through and then impact of all these different media uh, that I've been talking about, online and offline. Okay, so here is a real world ad for a well known brand, Pepsi, by the side of a road. It's a poster site. Okay, everybody seen one of those? I'm sure. Here is the same ad on a television. Here it is on your mobile phone. Here it is actually on Captive Media, my company. I'm just going to throw this in because I can. We can call this close proximity. Uh, so it's a new form of a uh, new channel, if you like. And here it is on traditional laptop-based. This is a Facebook display ad. 
And if anyone's having trouble spotting where it is, that's it there. There we go. That's how your digital ad appears on Facebook. So the research we have done, we just pull all these apart. Outdoor, TV, mobile, close proximity, online. So we ask consumers how, firstly, cut through. There we go. How noticeable they find these. If you were in the neighborhood of one of these, or in the same room as one of these, the likelihood it would catch your attention. So just cut through. Uh, and we asked about 300 people to rank it on a scale of one to five, five being very noticeable and one being unnoticeable. And I'll just share the results with you very quickly. There you go. So for outdoor, for example, a few people thought, uh, eight or nine percent by the looks of it, unlikely to ever pay attention. These people. Whereas most people were quite likely, four out of five. And for television, you got a similar sort of profile, meaning that the average out of five was 3.7 for outdoor posters, and actually 3.7 for TV. You see how that works? So is, a, is that good, 3.7 out of five? Probably is quite good. Now let's have a look at the bottom row, which is more digital, starting with mobile. Now here, it's quite interesting that you've straight away got a kind of double spike. This is split opinion. You've got the lovers and the haters. I'm slightly exaggerating, but there's a significant body of people who are tuning this out, or at least they say they are, um, and that makes for a lower average, a 2.8, when you combine all those. I'll do this one next, the online. And look at that. Not many lovers of an online display ad, that's 1.9. Uh, and lastly, again, because I can indulge me, that's our own media there, came in with a creditable 3.5, although um, we realized, of course, the sample of people here had to be 50-50 male-female, and this particular me medium is unusual because it's only in male washrooms. We only target a male audience, so when you strip out the female respondents who clearly hadn't seen it, it goes up to 4.4. There you go. Um, now, so that's if you noticed it cut through. Let's think about impact. So how influential would you find this ad? Are you likely to be positively impressed by one of these if you saw it? How would it make you feel about the brand? So a different set of criteria. Um, once again, here they are. I'll just rattle through them quickly. Outdoor, 2.6. 2.8 for TV, so lower scores. People are claiming, at least, to be uh, a little harder to influence. Let's look at mobile, though. 2.1, a little lower still. Online, once again, 1.7, very low. There's us with 2.5. Oh, 2.7 if you strip out the ladies. Um, so we're up there. All of which means, if you were to plot these in a slightly nerdy way, Here's noticeability on this axis. Here's impactfulness um, on that axis. Yeah, they form a kind of a little spread. And look, there's online and there's mobile. In other words, URL, digital. And there's outdoor and there's TV. There's us to complete the set. Real world up here. So essentially the, the digital or online media are performing less well in terms of cut-through and impact. And the real-world ones, which we all accept are less targeted, are, however, having more cut-through and more impact, according to a random bunch of consumers. Um, and actually, when you think about it, that might make sense from the point of view of a broad marketing mix and with one eye on your branding, um, that... Here we go. There may be an explanation in consumer behavioral psychology or evolutionary biology that it is the very wastefulness of the large poster by the roadside that says something about the owner of the poster site. Like a peacock's feathers. The very fact that I've evolved this thing, which is expensive to own, conveys some information about my fitness and health as a mate. Now, is there any analog to this? Well, yes, I certainly think there is. The, the age of ego advertising is far from dead. And uh, look at that, 200 feet high. So there is a role for
for offline, real world, to do the branding in a way that online, albeit more targeted, finds a little hard. Okay. Now I will say something about targeting very briefly, and I'll just share with you a 20 second vision of the future from a company called Lita. So it works. This is Martha. Hi. At the mall. <laughs> That's a nice blueberry bag. Ooh, that could be a perfect present for my daughter. And there's an instant 20% off on the same bag. Mm, I better hurry. Time is running out. There you go. Is that clear what's happening there? She's out shopping. She gets a voucher on her phone, targeted to her at the very moment she needs it. Hands up, has that happened to anybody in this room? Really? Okay, please come and find me after. I'd love to hear about your experience of it. I mean, our, our view is that technically that is quite hard to do and very, very hard to pull off. It requires, um, was it Martha, to have Wi-Fi on, on her phone in that example, or more usually to have Bluetooth on, which drains the battery and only 20% of people usually have it on, it requires her to have push notifications on, and in many cases, it requires her to have downloaded an app. Most cases, not always, but by and large today. So, very hard to do. Everyone is talking about this in the industry, but we, I'm still waiting to be convinced by it. Um, it is, of course, the holy grail, what you just saw there. And if anybody really could do that, they'd have a billion dollar company, absolutely. So I'm fascinated by any experience. Please do come and find me. But by and large, it's, it's hard. What's next? Coming to the end. So why would anybody put those 180 billion into online? Well, there is an interaction between online and offline. Online influences our offline purchase decisions. This is the classic marketing funnel. You're all familiar with that, Marketing 101. I start with my awareness, and I come all the way down through consideration to purchase intention. So everybody's got to make this journey before they make a purchase. So what I've said so far, I, I think, conveys that digital is quite good at this end, but to get the eyeballs in the first place, the fame, that's perhaps more where offline has a role. And it, it cuts both ways. So. It's particularly true for high involvement purchases like holidays, cars, where we all, of course, go online and we do our research, and then we might go into the showroom to, uh, to buy the car. Um, but that does cut both ways. I mean, who here has seen a great looking dress in a shop and then gone home to buy it online? I know I have. Oh, well, anyway. Uh, but you get my, my point. It, it cuts both ways. And this purchasing funnel is a lot less linear now than it was when the textbooks were written. In fact, it's more of a French horn. And, and this is really interesting because this is genuinely, I, I like this, this really is much closer to the way we arrive at a purchase decision. All around and about, there's many influences. Sorry, the uh, chart's not very clear, but I might use user-generated content. I would surf peer reviews, recommendations from friends. Um, it's often said we're in the third age of branding, if you've heard that. In the first age, you know, 200 years ago, was the individual you trusted, Mr. Penning's cheese. That's what I, I, my mother trusted Mr. Penning's. The second age, the age of brands as we know them. You know, so cathedral cheddar. I, who, know, who makes that? I don't know, but I've seen the ads for cathedral. But the third age, which we're entering, is this age where I don't, it's not so much that I've seen Cathedral Cheddar advertised, but if the peer reviews I can find on it are good, that is what's needed to establish my trust. And I might put my trust in a brand I've never seen advertised if I'm convinced by the peer reviews and the word of mouth and every other. But how, as a marketeer, do you navigate your way through this? Well, it's tough. All of which brings us to, wouldn't it be nice if we did understand what the influences were on that French horn? 
and if we could attack those. And luckily, here's a piece of my favorite research I've seen published over the last two years. Wonderful piece of research by Google, v, uh, Google, v? <laughs> Google and Ogilvy and TNS, simply asking consumers what it was that influenced them along this funnel. Two and a half thousand respondents over product categories ranging from detergent to BMWs. And here it is in a single chart. Green is online URL. Blue is real world factors IRL. So if we start with the green, there's search at the bottom. So it's there, but it's actually only the number 10 influence according to consumers. Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube how-to videos, my goodness. Nowhere on that chart do you see online display ads. So much for that 180 billion that's being spent every year. And now look at the top two influences. They are real world, word of mouth, and retail and store visits. The consumer often makes up their mind once they arrive in the shop. Uh, yes, as any pollster will tell you, the consumer may change their mind when they're in the uh, polling booth, so, so to speak, from the election last year where the pollsters all got it wrong. Um, and yeah, in fact, McKinsey reckon that 40% of all purchase decisions are made in the shop. They decide at the last minute. Ogilvy Active reckon that's 70%. It clearly depends a bit on which product category. If you go out for a beer tonight, it's 70%. The people who leave the house in the morning saying, I will have Stella Artois, they exist, but they're in the minority. If it's a car, you're much more likely to uh, uh, have decided before you get into the shop. And, and this means that you are seeing growth in new media channels like digital out of home. I'm sure we've all seen posters moving, po well, like, sorry, legally they can't move actually by the side of the road. They may be digital, but they're not allowed to move. Whereas at a bus stop, they can a bit, I think, in an elevator. So screens that reach people in a digital way, but in the real world, are growing faster than paid search. Okay. Which brings me to my last um, assertion. That there's something more fundamental stemming from all this that really happiness for the advertiser is more closely linked than ever to the happiness they engender in the consumer. And to illustrate the point, I'll share with you a slightly old clip. This is from Microsoft or MSN probably seven or eight years old now, but it exemplifies the shift that's been well underway for quite a while. I need a sound up. Hey there. Long time no see, looking good. Yeah, let's just keep this simple. I want a divorce. What now? I think you heard me just fine. Come on, this is me. What's wrong? We don't talk anymore. I just put down a mill on a TV commercial just to talk to you. Exactly. You do all the talking. I never get a chance. You talk on our website, can't you? It's not exactly a dialogue. What about the print campaign, hmm? You can't tell me you missed the billboard in Times Square. That was like a 200-foot tall declaration of love. If you knew me, you'd know I don't care about that. Know you? Sweetheart, I know everything about you. You're 28 to 34. Your online interests include music, movies, and laser hair removal. You have a modest but dependable disposable income. Am I the only one not getting the problem here? I'm out of here. Oh, come on. Don't be like that. Look, I'll tell you what. Come back here tomorrow. I'll give you the chance to win a Bahamas vacation. There's a small chance, minuscule, but technically still a chance. Yeah. So how's that for a, relation, a broken relationship between advertiser and consumer? Um, and this has been going on for the last decade and accelerating that um, there is a 
fundamentally different relationship between consumers and advertising. The consumer expects something in return for their attention. And um, um, uh, Chris Arnold of um, Brand Republic talks about time theft. That if, if you as an advertiser get in front of me and waste 30 seconds of my time without giving me anything in return, I'll slightly resent you as a consumer. Um, consumers are beginning to consciously trade their attention. Now, this is really interesting. So early examples began as far back as 20, 20, uh, 2007. Anybody hear of Blick? It was a mobile network where you got free minutes. It could be completely free if you accepted ads on your mobile phone. I mean, you could argue you go even further back to ITV as a version of that. But now, my children at least, not so much me, in the games they play on their iPods, absolutely explicitly trade. That, look at this. Would you like to watch an ad in return for gold coins? Yes, please. <laughs> and the ad starts 30 seconds. They may watch it. They may not. But they are rewarded for their attention. Which to me, that's just the best example of the wider trend. This is absolutely explicit. But in the future, we will be paid for our attention. Think about that. In some form, it might not be monetary, but it, we do expect it to be something valuable to us. It might be some, something shareable to be entertained. Um, and it's a, it's a new relationship between consumer and brands. I'll just finish off because I can with one such example that Captive Media did. For cancer charity Anthony Nolan, he devised a uh, video game which enabled consumers to throw tomatoes at politicians, something everybody loves doing, totally off the wall, very engaging. And after playing this for a few seconds, then the branding for the charity comes up and the hard-hitting message around register for the bone marrow donor um, website. This, because it rewarded the consumer with something fun, consumers responded. And I think 186,000 people played that particular game. I think we've got the data here. Uh, and 1,572 people signed up, which was an uplift of 75% on what they had done in the previous period. That's all the data. We also measured how many tomatoes were thrown at each politician as a side effect. You can see Nigel Farage was the runaway winner. But <laughs> it's silly, but it's engaging. Um, and that won a drum award and a brand republic award and is up for a Cannes Lion. So we're proud of that. I think that's all I have to say. So thank you for your attention. I'll gladly take any questions or take this debate further. Uh, offline.